All right. By my, uh, <clears throat> by my uh, computer's clock, it's four o'clock. So let me call this August 3rd meeting of the Concord Select Board to order. The first item on our agenda is a consent agenda on which there are minutes to approve of July 20th, 2020 and gift acceptances from the Concord Carlisle Community Chest, $3,062.50 for the volunteer coordinating coordinator account. Also from the Community Chest, $10,335.50 to the outreach workers account. Also from the Community Chest, $4,427 to the social services co coordinator account. And for Mrs. Marion H. Goslovich, $4,000 to the Council on Aging account. And from the Concord Carlisle Youth Baseball, $7,700 to the Ripley Baseball Field gift account. We are grateful for all of those gifts. And I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Um, Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you. And I know it's, it passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is the town manager's update. Mr. Town Manager. Hi, good evening. So a few things to touch on. Uh, first, some good news. We received a grant um, from the Mass Trails program for $135,000. Um, that will be matched by $250,000 request that we received from CPA, um, or I shouldn't say received, that CPA approved for the annual town meeting warrant that we're gonna hopefully have in September, on September 13th. Um, and so that is good news. It'll help us um, help uh, engineering and permitting for the pedestrian bridge that we want to build over the Assabet River in West Concord. So um, that's a bright spot for us. Um, so on the not so bright spot, a couple of things uh, we received. We, uh, the police have noticed a, an uptick in car break-ins uh, in the Revolutionary Road area. And it's, this is a reminder to all residents to please lock your vehicles. Um, you know, don't store valuables in them. Uh, it, it's because they're not really breaking into the cars, they're just opening the doors and removing articles. So um, it's a common problem. Uh, so it's important to just please don't leave valuables in your car and, and keep them locked uh, when they're outside. We are also um, working on um, tracking uh, hurricane slash tropical storm Isaias, um, it's looking like Tuesday evening or Wednesday or into Wednesday, there could be heavy, heavy rainfall and, and high winds. Um, the forecasts I've been looking at have been kind of changing every day. So we're, we are monitoring at CMLP has had some emergency planning preparation uh, discussions. Um, Fire Chief Tom Judge, who's also emergency management director has also kind of initiated um, planning discussions. So we're gonna keep our eyes on it, uh, but we may be putting out some notifications to the community if we feel um, you know, residents should be taking some actions for themselves. Um, so the uh, other thing we have is we are meeting on Friday. I, I asked uh, to meet with the restaurants um, again on Friday. And the, the topic is going to be um, safe dining. Uh, I know many of them have spent a great deal of time and energy uh, to improve um, sanitary sanitation efforts, cleaning, uh, some have installed UV lights into their HVAC systems, and uh, I don't know that the message is getting out to people. And if for, I think I know diners want to feel want to know that they're safe before they go back out, and so we're going to try and come up with ways where we can really communicate that message wholly as a group of restaurants, not just one or two, you know, trying to trying to do that on their own. Uh, and another positive um, economic vitality uh, thing. The downtown businesses are once again working together to have another sidewalk sale. And, uh, there was one in mid-July, and by most accounts, it was pretty successful with limited marketing. I think they just wanted to try it out to see if they could pull it off before they marketed it more broadly. Uh, this one is, I'm going to say, tentatively scheduled for August 15th. Um, there are a, a, a significant and growing list of businesses that are participating downtown, and now uh, I think West Concord is trying to organize to have sidewalk sales on the same day. And I think that's also the day that we'll have our um, painting 
uh, of the picnic tables event at the umbrella. So August 15th is going to be a pretty fun day in Concord. So um, just keep, I'm sure we'll be posting updates on our uh, tourism website and Concord together. I'm sure we'll also be posting updates on that, that event coming together, but people around town will be, it'll be fun and it'll feel, it'll feel good to see people shopping in the, in the commercial districts again. And um, so is Kari on? Oh, she is, okay. So I know there's been some confusion about um, voter registrations. I've received actually a couple of emails about it. I know it's happened to some of you potentially. So I invited Kari here to kind of explain what's happening with that and what you'd need to do or not do uh, if you did get a cancellation notice, Kari. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in uh, July, earlier in July, we uh, mailed out uh, notices of inactivation to households, um, a total of 2,336 voters um, were, were affected by this notice. And this notice is sent out annually by law. Um, Mass General Laws Chapter 51, Section 37 requires that the Board of Registrars move voters who do not respond to the annual census. Um, in other words, we don't receive the response. That doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't send the response. Um, a lot of things can happen in between the mailing and the receiving, um, but we are required to, to move those voters to an inactive voter list so that we are not carrying all, all the people who have potentially moved away on our voter list. So the being moved to the inactive voter list does not take away a voter's right to vote. We keep a voter on the inactive list through two state elections. So that means a presidential and a state election. If a voter does not respond by voting, does not respond to the census, does not respond by um, signing a petition or nomination paper, then we assume that the voter has moved and we delete them. We cannot delete any voters unless we hear from the voter or they've been inactive through two state elections. So if you've received this notice, you and, and there's a um, postage paid envelope that went out with the notice. So you can return that to us. And we prefer that you do that so that we can reactivate your census. And, um, or simply by filling out the uh, vote by mail form, you are reactivating your voter status. Unfortunately, we have to go through this process of inactivating voters annually. Now this becomes really complicated because now there's this thing called automatic voter registration. So anytime you go to an agency, such as the Registry of Motor Vehicles, you're automatically um, re-registered to vote unless you opt out of doing that. And we get those notices as well. So that allows us to reactivate voters. That's another method of doing that. However, this census law, it almost seems a little outdated based on all the opportunities that people now have to register and re-register and reactivate themselves, we still have to mail this, this form out annually if people don't return the, the actual census form. Um, one, of, one of the thoughts I've had is to possibly have a separate um, email address for the town census and give people the opportunity to scan and return the census that way. I have to make sure that's a legal option, but it would be it would be nice to just, you know, pave the way for a, a much simpler and more streamlined process for voters. And we feel badly we were not, um, because of our limited staffing during COVID, able to send out a second census mailing that's not required by law, but we've always done it as a courtesy. We, we just didn't have the, the manpower to do that this year. So as a result, we had a much higher level of um, voters who received the mailing. And we, we feel badly that people are worried that this affects their ability to vote, but the letter itself does state that, that anyone receiving that letter 
has has every right to still vote in the elections this fall. All right, thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that. Stephen, did you have any additional comments? Yeah, just one more. Well, one more thing for for two locations. Um, I, we continue to receive uh, emails and, and contacts um, regarding um, issues of people not abiding by the rules at some of our outdoor spaces, uh, in particular Esterbrook Trail um, and White Ponds. And so just as just a reminder for the community that there are rules associated with the use of both of those places. Um, those rules are generally posted prominently. Uh, and we just ask that, um, that, that people observe those rules, especially um, keeping dogs on leash if you're on Esterbrook Trail and um, not swimming in Satchams Cove uh, at White Pond. Swimming there is not allowed. Uh, and being respectful of the parking rules in the neighborhood. It is it is a residential neighborhood around White Pond and um, the people there have um, seen a lot more, you know, uh, day users, so to speak, coming in, which is fine. But if there's not available parking, then then that should be assigned to folks to, to come back another time. So we want to, we know people want to get out and um, be able to enjoy the outside. And if we were talking about before the meeting started, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to have options for kind of getting out of your four walls, but uh, people just need to be respectful of the rules and um, make it so everyone can enjoy them. So that's, that's my, just, uh, I just wanted to message that because it's where it seems like it's increasing in intensity uh, in terms of the complaints we're getting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Terry. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, for that reminder. Question about um, the ranger program. Would we mm -hmm. have a ranger program at White Pond or anywhere else this summer? We um, we did we did not. The ranger program ended up being paused um, early and on in the pandemic because we weren't sure what was happening. Okay. There was a time, as you may recall, where we thought we were going to end up closing a lot of our outdoor spaces. I think right. we were. Uh, back in, I have no idea when it was, but it may have been in April, may have been in May. We thought we were within, you know, moments of getting a, a, a governor's order on trails, ponds, you know, things like that. It did not end up happening in the way we thought. So um, we didn't, we'd kind of set the ranger program aside and then things opened up much more quickly. And we just, quite frankly, lost track of the fact that we didn't advertise and hire rangers. So now we are working try and find some folks who would be interested in doing that, especially people who have been furloughed from rec programs in the BD Center. And we've been, we did some initial outreach a couple of weeks back and didn't get uh, any, anybody who wanted to do it. So we're trying again to see if we can find somebody. We did advertise the positions as well, but didn't get, it's not, it's not an easy job as you might imagine. Uh, and so we're, we are trying to fill those positions, but we've, we've had a hard time doing it. Well, thank you. Linda? Um, oops. Stephen, I know um, there's a good signage at White Pond. Um, is there also good signage at uh, Sackham's Cove? I, I believe I believe so. I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't been out there to see it firsthand, but uh, and I, I, I think Kate's on on here as well. She can maybe speak to that. But I do believe um, all of the areas are signed. I know uh, NRC does an excellent job of, of installing and maintaining um, signage and making sure people are aware of the rules. Okay. Yep, Kate Hodges, Deputy Town Manager. Um, there's some there's some signage out there um, specific to uh, you know not swimming and you know responsible use of the property. Today, Marsha Rasmussen, the Director of Planning and Land Management, Delia Kay, Natural Resources Director, Ryan Kane, Rec Director, Ryan Orr, Facilities Director, and I met via Zoom, um, and we are approaching a couple of. Um, folks who were working for the recreation department as um, weekend site supervisors. Um, and we have uh, received confirmation from one of them that they would be interested in coming back. Ranger program paid at a different rate um, than the rec program. So we're gonna pay at the higher rate um, and hopefully have that person uh, come back after doing some training with Delia. So that's just, um, I didn't get to connect with the town manager on that because I found out three minutes before this meeting started. So we're waiting um, on uh, word from the other uh, site supervisor and then we'll hopefully have um, alternating schedules so that they're covered um, every day. And, um, and we're thinking somewhere along the lines of either a 1030 to seven uh, schedule or uh, 11 to seven or a 
uh, 12 to 8. Um, we uh, understand that there is quite a bit of activity going on after dusk, um, but would like to sort of uh, have the staff that are um, non-police, uh, non-sworn members uh, come off at that point when it's when it's dark outside and, and leave uh, those few hours um, to the police. So we're going to be checking with Ch uh, Chief O'Connor on that as well. Thank you, Kate. Are there any other questions for the town manager, Jane? <clears throat> You're muted. Sorry. Um, I wanted to thank Stephen for the update and Kate for the update. Um, uh, yeah, Sachem's Cove has seen a huge amount of uh, uptick in activity. And um, as the lucky liaison to the White Pine Association, I get to see a lot of emails. Um, and it's not, I'm glad that we're taking it seriously um, because obviously the town has a, a big investment in White Pond in the beach on one end and the conservation land on the other as well as the municipal land. Um, so um, one of the things that has also been brought to my attention is the uh, willful tearing down of a lot of signs. You know, we did a, the town put a lot of time and investment into that area, which was wonderful. And it was acknowledged by all of the abutting residents to have had a really positive impact. And I'm glad to see that we're gonna pick up the ball before it really gets dropped, you know, and, um, and get on top of the situation. So thank you. All right. All right, thank you. So the next item on the agenda is the chair's remarks. I have just two quick Mike, remarks to make. Mike, I, I don't mean to be rude, but before Kari leaves, can she just tell us, please, whether families that were taken off the voting rolls or are notified also simultaneously received voter registration by mail, or whether those folks have to, this is whether they have to go and vote in person. Thank you. I'm sorry, but I don't want her to leave and not have that answer. Uh, so voters are moved to an inactive voter list. They are not taken off the voter rolls. One way of reactivating their voter status is by um, responding to the vote by mail, returning the vote by mail postcard. Um, that did go out to every active and inactive voter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. So, Chair Jim Marks, I have two very uh, quick remarks to make. First, about the public hearing. So, uh, on the town website, we have created uh, particular files for each of the three public hearings where the agenda for those will uh, be posted along with all of the supporting material. I think for the Joint Finance Select Board meeting on the 17th, the agenda has been posted and I understand it's been posted for the planning board. And we're just waiting to hear back from the chair of the finance committee before finalizing the agenda for the public hearing on the 18th. And so all of the material uh, for each of those public hearings and the articles will be in those folders. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, the town sent out notices to all of the people who will make it, be making presentations with the deadlines for uh, getting their material into that uh, to that particular folder. The second uh, comment I want to make is I've, I have invited the superintendent of schools, uh, Dr. Lori Hunter, to come to the select board meeting on August the 10th to talk to us about the school's reopening plan. She has a detailed plan for opening uh, both the elementary school, the middle schools, and the high school. And I thought it would be in everybody's interest if we heard directly from her about uh, those plans. And she uh, said she's more than happy to come. So she will be on our agenda for the 10th, uh, 10th of August. So that's all the remarks I have. The uh, next item of, uh, on the agenda is continued the public hearing for the library agreement. Uh, before I ask for a motion to open the public hearing, let me say what uh, has transpired since our last select board meeting. As you know, we had a public hearing last Monday and a lot of good comments and suggestions. In addition, before the public hearing and after the public hearing, we had written comments from a number of folks in town. 
And what I attempted to do working with Mario, Sherry, and Stephen is to catalog all of those concerns that were raised. And I distributed uh, uh, to earlier today a memorandum from me that lays out all of the concerns I believe we've heard from various folks and together then note, noted in red the proposed action uh, that we uh, would propose to take. And then the second document that I sent out was a revised draft of the library agreement, where in red again, I've entered into the agreement those comments from the first memorandum. So this evening, when we open the public hearing, I want to begin by going through that uh, memorandum that I wrote to talk about the changes that we've uh, heard, the proposed changes that we heard from citizens and what we have proposed to do about that. And then finally, I would note that one of the issues that was raised at the public hearing last Monday was a concern about ethics, uh, the ethics of whether or not the curator and director acting behind on behalf of the corporation created an ethical dilemma. I forwarded that concern written by Ms. Pardee. She was kind enough to send along her written, or the comments that she read at our select board meeting. And I sent those along with a copy of the draft agreement to town council. Uh, he is on vacation and will get back to us, but won't get back to us until later this week. So after we've had our public hearing tonight, we will continue the public hearing until next Monday, the 10th, so that we can resolve that ethics question raised by Ms. Pardee and deal with any of the additional concerns that will be uh, raised uh, this evening. Now, I've tried to capture all of the uh, concerns expressed by the public, both in writing and at the hearing, uh, in the redlined uh, draft agreement that I sent out uh, today. I'm sure I missed some. In fact, Mario is kind enough to send along a note uh, telling me that I've missed some and we'll go through that uh, later on. So I wanted to uh, make the uh, preface statement before we open the public hearing. So we will, we will close or continue the public hearing today, but we will not vote on the agreement and the earliest we will vote on the agreement will be next week, assuming we can incorporate the changes and we have a way to resolve the potential ethics conflict raised by Ms. party. So, well, sorry, long-winded. Uh, Linda, I would certainly entertain a motion to open the public hearing. Move to open the public hearing, which is being continued from July 27th uh, select board meeting. Thank you, okay. second. Thank you, Jan. Would you please call the roll? Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hodgkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo, aye. Thank you. So going back now to the memorandum that I spoke about. Uh, and that was unanimous, correct? Yes, it was unanimous. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, there were three primary issues raised at the select board meeting. One at first was a conflict of interest. I've already talked about that. The second was the unfinished uh, uh, MOU with respect to maintenance. We have simply deleted that language and will replace it by language indicating that maintenance is, maintenance is a responsibility of the library, corporation, and janitor janitorial services are the responsibility of the town. We will continue to work, however, on the MOU, and I know uh, as town managers are going to be working with uh, Jeff Adams to get that done. The third that we heard about was that the language in section 10, I think this was uh, Diane Proctor that raised this issue. The language in section 10 is not sufficient with respect to the town's ability to provide funds for renovation or an expansion of the library. Our proposed solution to that was to simply add to the language there if appropriated at an annual or special town meeting. And that would make it clear that any funds provided by the town outside of its operating budgets for the library uh, would be those that would be approved at town meeting. Example of that historically has been funds provided by the uh, community preservation appropriation. We received a letter from the League of Women Voters 
uh, saying that we should be um, explicit with respect to defining the director's responsibility of staffing levels and supervision. Uh, so there, that's two parts, one with staffing levels and one with staff supervision. With staffing levels, we uh, have added determination of staffing levels to section three, which lays out the town's responsibility. However, uh, with respect to staff supervision, that is already included in the, uh, in the draft agreement under the responsibilities of the library. Uh, we received a letter from public private from former members of the public private partnership committee. They raised a number of process concerns. They also raised concerns about the proposed MOU. And they asked the select board to postpone a decision until after the library committee had provided input. I already addressed the MOU issue. And as you know, if you attended last week's meeting, we agreed to postpone it and get comments from the library committee which in fact we did uh, Friday morning receive those comments. Now the library committee raised the following issues. The first issue was concern about the clarity of the library committee's role and charter. And so we added to the footnote on the first page of it, the, the following quote, the library committee's administrative code defines the role and responsibilities of the library committee. Those was also pointed out to us in a note from Mr. Perry that I received uh, Sunday evening. And uh, in addition to when the library committee may have sent their memorandum, they indicated that they were going to be coming to the select board sometime in the future to talk about potential uh, updates to the uh, code. It's been, I think, since I don't have it in front of me, but I think it was 1997 when the last uh, change was made to that. The committee raised issues about the role of the town manager and director as reflected in se section two. And we changed the language in the first sentence of section two to better reflect the intent of that section. The committee also raised the issue of staffing and conflict of interest. And I've addressed both of those before. The committee also suggested an additional item be added to the ownership of property, intellectual property, branding materials, and logos. And so we have added all three of those items to both the ownership section for the town and the ownership uh, section for the uh, corporation. Finally, the committee suggested to improve communication between the corporation and the community that the corporation extend a standing invitation to the library committee to appoint a member to attend trustee meetings in order to stay up to date on cor corporation activities. And further uh, stated the corporation would be offered the opportunity to be on the committee's agenda to provide updates. We added a paragraph to section 11, which I'll read to you. From time to time during the fiscal year, the library corporation shall provide an opportunity for members of the library committee to attend the library corporation meetings. So uh, and with respect to the library committees uh, inviting the trustees, that's a matter for the committee to take up itself. We received an email from the town clerk indicating that in section five, ownership of property, uh, the paragraph of uh, about the town's ownership should include uh, town records. That's uh, a particular oversight. Uh, and so we have added all town records, including pre 1870 town records and all proprietors records are also owned by the town to that section. And Sunday evening, as I uh, mentioned, we received a, a memorandum from Mr. Perry. Uh, in which he uh, laid out a number of concerns. The first was in the introductory part of the uh, of the, the draft agreement. There was a deletion of the words easily and entire from the first purpose of the library. And he was concerned that that was uh, 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 a concern for Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, second concern he raised was a process concern that earlier drafts were not shared with the public nor with key members of town staff, mentioning specifically the town clerk. We've just uh, talked about that and we've incorporated her concerns. 
uh, that the agreement makes no mention of the Library Committee Administrative Code. We've dealt with that also by adjusting the footnote on page four. Next, he raised similar concerns that others have raised with respect to the MOU regarding maintenance. This uh, too was addressed uh, above. And then he raised three concerns that frankly, I, we just did not, I did not have the opportunity to try to address with anyone today. The first was, and I'm kind of quoting, maybe we should be stepping back and facilitating a full community review of the draft, draft agreement from the perspective of the relevant town committees and administrative departments. Next in section four, number 10, he suggested adding scheduling special events and programs in coordination with the corporation, the friends of the library and the umbrella arts section. And finally, he states that the draft agreement does not contain a single word about our sustainability commitment as part of town policies practice or obligations of the corporation or the town moving forward. So uh, the only thing I would say about that last one is in section 11, I believe it is. In communication, we, we did add in there that the actions of the library corporation was to expand expansion and facilities improvements were to be in line with the goals of the town as articulated in the Long Beach plan. Um, so, I think it's appropriate for me to also uh, mention that in section 10, paragraph two, we say that any um, projects would be um, consistent with town goals yep. and sustainability would be one of those. Yes. So uh, before we turn to public comments, I, I uh, would like to ask my colleagues on the board for uh, their reactions to these proposed changes. I think all of the proposed changes improve the document. I'm glad we could incorporate so many of the suggestions from various citizens in this. Um, so I, yes, uh, Terry and then Susan. Thank you, Mike. I, there was a lot of work putting this together in a short amount of time. And it was especially helpful that you put the changes in red. That saved a lot of time for me and others reviewing it. Um, I think you have incorporated a lot of the suggestions, um, perhaps not all of them quite yet. So I'm glad we're going to have a few more days and we don't have to adopt it tonight. Um, my two suggestions are, first of all, I think that town council um, probably does and should um, always review any kind of legal document that the select board are going to sign on behalf of the town. So not just for the ethics um, question, but just in general, it would be good practice if since council is going to get this anyway, if they could just if yeah, they have any comments, that review the entire document. Correct. Okay. Number two, it's not signed by the select board, it's signed by the town manager. Okay. Well, anyway, that would be great if they review the whole document. And well, the select board are going to vote to adopt it before the town manager signs it. Is that correct? We're going to recommend it. Hopefully, at some point, we recommend. will recommend it to town manager. Okay, great. And then my other comment is. I really like in section seven, the idea that the corporation and the town are going to work together on a mutually you know, cost-effective and efficient solution for maintenance. And so I'm really glad to hear that they're gonna continue working on it. And I'm wondering in section seven, if we could add something like the corporation may elect to contract with the town for maintenance services. And that's not exactly the right wording, but something that doesn't rule it out. Because it says in section seven right now, the way it's written, it says something like all maintenance will be provided by the corporation. And we want to leave it open that possibly they will work with the town in the future 
or, or contract with the town or whatever. Uh, we did we did talk about that. I talked about that with Mario and Sherry. And in fact, the corporation does reserve the right to contract with anybody they want to contract with. Right. Uh, to provide these services. So I think that uh, whether it's included in the draft or not, uh, we're going to continue to work on some arrangement between the town and um, mm -hmm. the town and the corporation. I didn't put it in that way. Sim simply because that's already a capability the corporation has and it doesn't need to be articulated in this agreement. So, but I suspect the corporation wouldn't care if some sentence was in there like that. And I see Sherry nodding. And, uh, Mario, do you have any, you're muted, but. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, the the sentence actually uh, allows, implies uh, that the corporation can contract with any vendor it sees fit. That would include the town. So the wording already encompasses the idea that the town would be one of the potential vendors. Well, I, I guess, Mario, that was the issue I had. When the, the vendor, I just felt like that might leave out the town. So maybe say vendor including the town or yeah, that, oh, I just don't want to preclude the town. That's all. Yeah, well, um, I have no problem with that because that's clearly implied. Thanks. Let's, let's consider that something we're going to do and we'll work on appropriate language so we don't need to take up everybody's time trying yeah. to do that. Susan, I think you were next. Yeah, actually you covered um, the, the questions that I had, but I did want to thank everyone for, for their input and also for the very quick turnaround in uh, incorporating changes into the document. Thank you. Sure. Any other comments from, from the select board? Seeing no hands, let me turn to then the public. If you, if you have a comment or a question you would like to raise, uh, please raise your hand. I see Tanya with her hand up, so please unmute yourself and tell us what your question is. Yes, Tanya Galas, thank you. Uh, just very quickly, um, I was uh, skimming through the document today, and two two I two issues caught my eye. One was under the gifts under Chapter Nine, the fact that any. Uh, ambiguity about who gets what request would be resolved in a spirit of uh, mutual uh, whatever cooperation. That seems a little kind of vague for a legal document. I mean, it's always good to have a spirit, spirit of good communication and coordination, but it, it doesn't seem specific enough for a legal document. Similarly, in terms of not being specific enough for a legal document under Section 11, the, the, both in Sections uh, Part C and Part D, the from time to time feels vague uh, in, in, in the sense that it might actually create problems in the future in terms of who thinks what is an appropriate time to time. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, do I see? Another hand, I suspect I, yes, Julie, please unmute yourself and identify yourself for the record. I should have asked Tanya to do that and I forgot, but uh, would you? Uh, 1381 Main Street. Um, I, I would like to recommend that the word sustainability actually show up in this document because I think it needs to be a salient concept that we keep in mind so that when projects are ongoing or new ones coming up, people actually think about that without having to go through many town documents to figure out which town goals to be followed. Okay. I, I frankly would support that myself. Um, Jane, is that a hand? Um, it was, and I, thank you, Julie, because as I've been sitting here thinking about the issues raised, uh, that was one that I was... I was mulling on, um, but I also just specifically, while I'm, I looked at the faces on the call uh, on this virtual meeting tonight, I would love to uh, know specifically from some of the folks who who made comments, whether they are 
how they are, how they feel about the way the comments have been reflected in the new document. Um, I don't mean emotional, but I mean, do they have we captured it? Because one of the things we're doing here is continuing the process to to get it right. And and I know Mike, you've made a a very good faith effort to do so. I'd you know I'd rather do it in real time. Sure. I think that's exactly why we're here. Tara, I see your hand. Unmute yourself, please, and identify yourself. Hi, I'm Tara Edelman. I live at 357 Ashotic Road in Concord, and I am the chair of the Town Library Committee. And um, I'm incredibly grateful that we had an opportunity to talk about this um, as a committee on um, last Monday or Tuesday, and um, and that Sherry Litwack was able to attend and discuss our feedback um, in real time. So we, in working with Sherry as representative of the corporation, were able to provide feedback like that was well in context. And we, I think we were all in agreement that these changes were appropriate. Um, so I have not had a chance to read the document, but based on what I've heard in this meeting, it sounds like our feedback is really well reflected. And, um, and, and again, I just want to express my gratitude for the collaboration. Terry Ackerman's been really helpful. Um, Sherry was really, really went out of her way to spend time with us. And, um, and the committee, I think, is pleased with um, where we've gotten so far. So thank you. Uh, uh, when you do have a chance to go through this memorandum and the draft agreement, if you have any additional concerns or questions, please email them directly to me. I'll make sure it gets to Sherry, Mario, and Stephen, and we'll uh, we'll take it from there. So thank you very much for your comments. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Jean Goldsberry. Jean, unmute yourself and identify yourself, please. Thank you, Jean Goldsberry, eighteen thirty-two Main Street. Um, I'm I'm really happy to hear you comment ahead of opening the the meeting that the meeting would be continued, having seen these documents uh, just sort of arriving in the last uh, 24 to 48 hours, it, there certainly wasn't time for, for people to, um, to have a chance to really review them thoroughly. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of the maintenance um, for the library, uh, section seven, so there, there will. It sounds like there will be continued work toward um, a an agreement between the library corporation and the town um, around additional maintenance that the town may may decide to do for the library or be paid by the library corporation to do. Um, I think the concept of, of trying to, um, to use resources wisely is really good. I just, I'm wondering, I guess two questions. Is it, isn't it possible for that to be done and incorporated right in the, this agreement? And um, failing that, um, is it the expectation of the library corporation, the town manager, and the ongoing members of the select board that whatever MOU is finally developed does come before the select board for approval? Well, I, um, thank you, Gene. And similarly, with my remarks to Tara, after you have had a chance uh, to review the documents that I Sorry, I just didn't get them finished until I got them sent out. Uh, please email me with any unresolved issues in there. Um, the I don't have any problem with it coming back to the town, uh, to the select board, but you would understand that it would be an agreement between the corporation and the town manager. Um, and the corporation has the ability right now without anything in the agreement uh, to contract with services. That's why we had attempted to put this MOU in uh, the draft agreement that you saw last week. And of course, we got objections from uh, all kinds of people for, 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 doing, for doing that. Uh, I, I, can, I can say that I'm happy to bring, uh, if there is a maintenance agreement between the corporation and the town, uh, to bring it back to the select board, not so much for approval, but for a chance for people to comment on it. I, I don't see that there would be any concern. I can see Sherry said nodding and Stephen said nodding. So, nothing I can commit that if one is 
arrived at between the town and the corporation will bring it back to a select board meeting so that it can be discussed by the public. All right. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm not seeing any other hands, but I have um, on my screen only 14 people and I see there are 35 people um, on the call. So if I can't see your hand and you want to talk, just unmute yourself and start talking. And please. Mike, that. Mike you can um, go way over to the right side of your screen where all the heads are and you'll see one out of two. And you click on that and you'll see all the other heads. I'm not seeing, I'm not. Oh. Um, hovering over on the right side to the right of Ned. Well, on my, Ned's Ned's not on my right, he's on my bar. But uh, anyway, if you if you are um, if any of the members of the select board can see somebody who's got their hand up, or if you can't be seen by anybody and you want to talk, identify yourself, and we'll be happy to hear from you. Does anybody see anybody with their hand up? I do now. Mr. Perry. Mike, uh, appreciate the quick turnaround. Uh, I'm interested in the hesitancy of uh, those people who are negotiating this to uh, put easily accessible in the entire community, those words back in the mission statement, which has been a part of the mission statement of the library for I don't know heard any resistance to that. What the hesitancy is there, Mike? I don't think I heard any hesitancy. Well, the, the document that you sent out, which you say is redlined, I, it did, didn't wasn't posted on the, on the website uh, in a redlined version. Your memo was in a redlined version. Uh, and the document that was dated... Um, Second, um, August 2nd, uh, doesn't have the word easily or the entire community in there. So clearly the library is resisting something. No, Mr. Perry, it's not. We just simply didn't have a chance to discuss it before the select board meeting. And we will discuss it. And I have every expectation that those two words will be put back in. But please don't suggest that there was reluctance on anybody's part. That's a, then you're muted. I think at least I can. No, I'm I'm just I'm just I'm just uh, uh, absolutely appalled that the words would come out on the 30th anniversary of the American with Disability, and I don't know what the intent was, what the purpose was, but there obviously was something, and uh, it's it's really appalling that that action would have been taken. Thank you. Uh, are there any other comments? Would Mike, oh, Dory, I can see you. Yeah, I just have uh, Mike. Uh, you Dory identify Keogh. yourself I'm, for us. Yeah, I'm doing that now, yeah. Um, Dory Keogh, 51 MacArthur Road. I, I want to come back to section seven, which was the original now forgotten or, or got deleted MOU. Uh -huh. And it seems to me that I, I don't disagree with it in any way, but I think that what's in there today and in the document which came out today says nothing basically you know you can make your own contracts but generally before the live the library corporation has taken care of all of its um, maintenance or facilities issues uh, and i think what's anticipated is quite a different operation this has really great effect not only for the library but for the town so if the town takes over it sort of becomes part of the town operation to do things like, I don't know, painting outside or lawn mowing or whatever. I, I think that it's changing the whole mixture of the corporation and the town relationship. So I would hope very much, really hope, that if and when this uh, Ar Article 7 or Section 7 is finalized, that it will come to be incorporated into the agreement if the, if the agreement is, is adopted before that time, and that when that happens, that it will follow the same procedure as we, I think the town is now committed to following, and that is a public hearing on, on anything that's added, not just a, a select board meeting. Um, I, I think 
it's, I think it has the potential to add more staff to the town that might be good, it might not be good, but I think it's something that looking ahead could be much larger than it first appears to be. So I hope that um, when the, and this probably isn't gonna happen until maybe a month or so now from now after town meeting, things will change. So I really hope that this, I, I don't I don't understand, I, I appreciate that you wanna get this done. I still don't understand it, but I think that section seven needs to come back to be discussed just as if it were a whole new memo, a whole new agreement. Thank you for your consideration to that. Well, I think I've already committed to bringing it back. Um, no, no, I, Mike, it, it, Mike. I heard you, Dory. Uh, no, 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 I just wanna say one more thing. I think that I is not maybe the right word because this might not happen after you're off the select board. I mean, if if I think that this needs a lot of consideration and discussion between the town and the library corporation, that may not happen in a month or month and a half. So it may not happen until, as the original idea was, December. In that case, I'm just operating, opening this to the select board that will be continuing at that point. The process should be when, a, when an, an agreement, a, a, a contract like this is being done, it should be done with the full public-private awareness of what's going on and awareness, the select board votes no matter when it is. But I just would like to make that point. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. All right, um, or do I see any additional hands? I don't see any additional hands. Do any of my colleagues see any additional hands? All right, then again, before we do it, we're, we will continue the public hearing until the 10th. And I would encourage anybody who has any additional comments or questions or suggestions about this to please get them to us as soon as we can. What I will do is working with uh, Sherry, Mario, and Stephen will try to do what I did this time, and that is to collect all the additional input that we've received and questions and try to resolve them, try to put together a memorandum that outlines what we propose to do and to provide a draft agreement uh, for everybody to read, and I'll try to get that done just as soon as I possibly can. So with that, I'd entertain a motion to continue the public hearing. Move to continue the public hearing until August 10th. Sure, second. Second. Okay. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hodgkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you, and I note that it passes unanimously. The next, uh, before we go to the next item, I, I should have asked this before the town manager. Did you want to report on the movie? Oh, um, yeah, actually. So we had a, a our first pop-up drive-in. Uh, thanks for the reminder, Mike. Uh, we did have our first pop-up drive-in movie, Larry, Raiders of the Lost Ark, last uh, uh, Wednesday night. And um, it was uh, it was great. It was a beautiful night. The rain really missed us. Um, there was a magnificent sunset, you know, sitting up at the parking lot at CCHS. And um, we had, um, I think, 80 or 90 cars. And people were, I know Terry was there, and people really seemed to be enjoying it. Um, we had two screens set up, so we were able to spread people out as best we could. Um, there were some technical difficulties getting the screens are inflatable and one of them had a little trouble getting going, but um, I thought it was a very pleasant evening. Received uh, a lot of positive feedback about it and we're doing one um, in a couple of weeks. We're, we're having Shrek, I believe, on the 13th. Right. On Thursday, sorry, it's I've, I've been doing that this entire time. I've been, I've been transposing Wednesday and Thursday in this event. It is Thursday night. Thursday, it was Thursday night, and it's going to be Thursday night, August 13th. Um, and so I believe uh, the tickets um, have already been um, committed for the 13th, and there are no walk-ins allowed, which we have to do for, you know, crowd management and social distancing and everything. So hopefully people on this call were able to get a ticket before it got oversubscribed right. or fu fully subscribed. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't mention that earlier. 
All right, uh, now the next item on our agenda is the town budget presentation. I see our chief financial officer is on. I assume she will be making the presentation. Good evening, Ms. LaFleur. Good evening. I, I do think the town manager is going to at least kick off the right. presentation though. Mr. Town Manager. Sure, well, um, so one of the things, uh, and I don't know if Carrie, you're gonna share your screen or not, but um, the, um, the impact of COVID-19 on revenues is knowable in some ways and still unknown in others. And so in, in anticipation of our September 13th annual town meeting, uh, Carrie and I have been working uh, at least weekly on making changes, amendments to the budget that was originally proposed uh, that is now what, what is in the current warrant. Um, two areas of focus for, uh, for expended for revenues, I'm sorry, are local receipts and state aid. And we were anticipating significant reductions in state aid um, that on Friday, we were late Friday, we received word that the governor and legislature had committed to level funding, both unrestricted, um, unrestricted uh, government aid uh, UGGA, unrestricted general government aid, and Chapter 70, which is funding for schools. So those will be at the FY20 levels, which is generous of the state. Um, I don't know how they're going to do it, but it's nice that they're giving us that that information to plan our budget around. So that kind of rearranged things for us. Um, and so we had to kind of go back through and over the weekend, um, you know, kind of recalibrate uh, where some of our assumptions and, and rethink some of our decisions. Uh, we'll go, the, the presentation itself has highlights. The only thing I would just say in terms of operating is something kind of a, an overarching assumption um, were uh, our approach um, was conservative um, and getting through uh, prioritizing operations for FY21 and preparing for FY22, which could potentially see even further reductions in local receipts and state aid. So we were, we were looking ahead at the next fiscal year as well as the current one that we are already in the midst of. So with that, I'd ask Carrie to kind of start. Um, and, and I want to thank Carrie for all the hard work that she and her team have put into this um, document. It's, it's, a, it's a, a lot of work. There were a lot of moving pieces and she and um, Brandon and John did an excellent job kind of tracking that all the way through. All right, I'm, I am trying to share my screen and incur, encountering technical difficulties. Um, no, we see it. Oh, you I, do? You have it on rebalancing the FY21 budget. Okay, and so does it change? Did it go to slide one? No. So somehow, Stephen, do you have it to share? Uh, no? I do. Um, I don't, this has been. Yeah, I don't. I have it. You want me to try? I mean, that would I be great, it. Kate. I couldn't, get, I, I couldn't get out of full screen for some reason. <laughs> and I have, I have some oh, um, minimized stop, screen. You have to stop sharing, and then I can carry. Stop sharing. I've just lost everything. Oh, all right. Hold on. All right, Kate, you're up. All right. Oh my goodness. How's that? Good. Start slideshow. I'm ready. All right. Perfect. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Okay. Are you able to advance to the next slide? Well, I'm beginning. Yeah. Did this work? Well, it, it's thinking. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. 
Okay, the next slide, please. Okay, so as Stephen said, honestly, the one of the biggest challenges that we had in taking a second look at the fiscal 21 budget was understanding what the magnitude of the problem was. Um, he mentioned the good news that we received last week in terms of state aid. You may have heard me mention, and certainly the finance committee members that are on the call, have heard me mention we really were looking at something that might have been a loss of revenue of about two and a half to three million dollars. And with the announcement of level funding of, of the two key accounts in state aid, we're really looking at something that's almost half of that. So right now we're looking at an estimated reduction in revenue of a million eight hundred and eighty-eight thousand um, dollars. This slide is just a just a quick overview of our four categories. Um, I would mention in terms of property tax, what we were looking to do really was to not make any changes in property tax. So when we when we put the or finalized the budget last December, uh, we wanted to leave that property tax increase as close to where we thought it would be last December. Uh, the only there there are two changes in property tax. The first is that we did go ahead and permanently finance the middle school feasibility study. That is exempt debt, so we did need to add that to property tax. The second thing that has happened is our original new growth estimate was 1.1 million, and we are now down to $900,000. And we're 100% confident with $900,000. Uh, we expect we may see it go a little higher than that, but it certainly won't go up to 1.1 million where we were back in December. Uh, so in terms of, of state aid, so level funding for Chapter 70 education aid and the unrestricted general government aid, but we still don't know about some of the minor categories. So we, we are still projecting 20 to 25% reduction in some of those minor categories. But when you compare uh, fiscal 20 to what we now expect in 21, it's really level. It's about $20,000 higher. So we're in good shape with, with state aid. Uh, local receipts, I'll talk about this a little bit in a, in a moment. We certainly are projecting some, some pretty big decreases in local receipts. And then one additional funding consideration is the ability of certain of our enterprise operations to be able to make payments to the general fund which reflect the cost of the services that, that the general fund provides to these enterprises. And specifically, we're talking about BD and recreation. So all of our enterprise funds are assessed charges for services that the general fund provides, such as payroll, um, banking, any human resources activities related to recruitments and such. We do assess them a fee but because of what's going on, um, the ability specifically of BD and the recreation funds to be able to pay those in 21 is really hampered. Next slide, please, Kate. Um, so state aid, we, we did go through this. I, I don't need to, I, I don't think I need to go through this anymore. Um, next slide, local receipts. So right now, here is where we're expecting to see the most significant reduction. And we're expecting a million six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollar reduction from our original fiscal twenty-one estimate, um, and and these really are coming in the uh, the area of local excise taxes. And if Kate, if you could go to the next slide, the particular excise taxes that we are concerned about are room occupancy, jet fuel, and meals, and and really room occupancy and and uh, meals tax. So this is a historical look. Um, so you can see what we've collected each year for the last several years. Um, these excise taxes are paid by local businesses directly to the state. And then the state returns them to us on a quarterly basis. Uh, but the quarters are slightly different than, than our typical quarters. So, so the first quarter in the fiscal year actually represents payments of these taxes for June, July, and August, second quarter, September, October, November. So they are a month delayed. And what you can see here is the, the lighter purple color shows 
the quarters in fiscal 20, last fiscal year, where the quarterly return was lower than the prior year. Um, so you can see we had a we had an issue with the the hotel motel room occupancy tax every quarter of this year, and it's hard for us to understand why this happens because we really don't have access to anything other than knowing who in town is registered to pay these taxes and then what is turned into us on a quarterly basis. Um, but, but definitely you can see, I think the most surprising thing for me when I looked at these was if you look at second quarter room occupancy tax for fiscal 20, significantly below the prior year. Um, and, and again, it's hard for us to know what was happening. It's below fiscal 18. Uh, correct, below fiscal 18. Um, and if you, go, if you go up to the graph on the top room occupancy, you can see a huge increase in fiscal 17, then again in 18. And this is when the, uh, the hotel over on Baker Ave Extension came online. So that's what's going on there. And then really significant increase again in 19 and then 20 overall, uh, definitely lower, but even lower than, than we might have expected in particular quarters. Hmm. The uh, impact was there, question. Sorry, is that, has anybody looked at Airbnb's impact? Unregistered perhaps? <laughs> Well, so that that's difficult because we really we can only see who's registered. And then I did several months ago provide the list that I had over to our um, building inspector and asked that he take a look at it and see, you know, was he aware of any other um, businesses that were um, providing Airbnb services. So that, that is definitely something that we're looking into. Hmm. Um, then the amounts that are listed in the darker purple color, those, those are quarterly returns from fiscal 20 that, that were higher than the prior year. So you can really see here, the issue with uh, meals tax and jet fuel was really in the fourth quarter. And that's completely understandable with what was happening with the pandemic. Um, Carrie? Yep. I have a question about this slide versus the previous slide. Um, um, are there other local excise taxes? And I don't know if you can go back to the previous slide or not. Okay, so in that slide, the subtotal of local excise taxes was um, going down um, from 4.8 million to 3.4 million, a, a loss of 1.4 million. And, and I, but then when we go to the next slide and you've got the room, jet and meals, there, there must be some other categories, right? Yes, there is. And, and I apologize for not making that clearer. So we have four local excise taxes, motor vehicle, and then the three that, that we just looked at. And so for the purpose of, of the slide, that's uh, the, the next slide where we looked at the historical data that excluded motor vehicle excise tax because we're not we're not seeing a particular issue there. So I apologize that it, it wasn't clear. Okay, well that's where I'm confused. Maybe you can help me out. Yep. On this slide, it looks like we're missing. 400,000 or something like that. But on the previous slide, it was 1.4 million. So I thought the rest was due to the motor vehicle and that's where I'm confused. Right, so so on the slide that is up, the revised estimate for fiscal 21 for these three items is 700,000. And then if you go back to the previous slide, the total for excise is 3.4 million. So the difference between 3.4 and 700,000 is the estimate for motor vehicle excise. Um, I don't understand is on this slide, the far right column in the pandemic um, FY21, 
we're down 1,471,000 on the from the current fiscal year uh, from fiscal 20 right yes but on the next slide only 400,000 of that is due to the room occupancy jet fuel and meals right on the are you, which which slide that uh Not the one that's up the next one the next one right so the so in this one you're you're going down from 1.186 million to 700,000 you're losing 400,000 on the room jet fuel and meals right yes from the actuals right so there's still a million that isn't on this slide. So I thought maybe the motor vehicle tax was going down a million. Um, it's it's not it's not going down a million. I I can provide some additional information okay. or follow up with you directly. Okay, thanks. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll I'll do that. All right. yeah. So so, Kate, if you could just go back to that that one slide. Um, so the, the current, actually, let's just, let's continue. I, I think I'll, we'll just, I'll just follow up with you, Terry, on, on that. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw you off your game. I just was No, wondering. no, that, that, that's okay. Um, so in terms of so we're we're looking at a million eight hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars that we need to uh, revise our our budget down, and there are a number of adjustments that we are able to make um, to our non-guideline or fixed costs. And the reason that we're able to do this is the the one of the first steps in putting the budget together is making estimates on our fixed costs. So we're doing that in September, in October, very, very early in the process, uh, long before we have any idea what our insurance premium renewals will be, long before we do our annual bond sale, we're putting, we're putting in these estimates. Well, the, one of the benefits of having a very late town meeting is we now know what our insurance renewals are. We know the results of our bond sale. So we're able to make better estimates uh, with insurance by plugging in actual premiums. We know in, in the case of health insurance, we know what our insurance, what our enrollments are. So we're able to sharpen our pencil and make those adjustments. Um, so the adjustments that we're able to make in total account for um, $367,000 in savings. And uh, that means that the, the total delta between our revised or reduced revenue and what we had in place for a fiscal 21 budget is $1,515,000. Now the downside to this is that um, the likelihood of us now closing fiscal 21 with much surplus has certainly gone down because we the, one of the reasons that we end up having surplus is we're using these early estimates and we don't really have a way to uh, revise those as we move through as we move past a certain point in the budget process so i did want to point that out but but we are able to um, take advantage of the late town meeting and make these changes. So again, a million five hundred and fifteen thousand is what we're now looking for. Um, the gap that we now need to close. Next slide, please. So at this time, uh, we have six additional revisions to propose or offer up to close the gap. And in, to, in these actually total a million eight hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. So if we were able to implement all of these six items, 
and the revenue estimates that we have hold, we would have a, a surplus, so to speak, of about $300,000. So that gives us a little bit of wiggle room as we get closer to town meeting and uh, potentially have the ability to make some additional just adjustments if they're needed. Um, I would mention that, that CPS and CCRSD are still going through an extensive review of their budget. And there may be further savings, particularly in the district assessment, given the recent announcement of uh, the level funding of Chapter 70. So just a, a quick comment on the balance there. <clears throat> um, as we noted at the outset, we were planning for uh, much deeper cuts to state aid. And so we had started on a path of decision making um, in terms of things that we were in reductions we were going to make to the proposed budget. And those, some of those thought processes had fully played themselves out. And when we got the good news on the state aid, um, you know, some of the reasoning behind the reductions went, went beyond financial. Uh, in the case of certain capital projects, it's the lateness with which we're actually gonna get our appropriations and the reasonable expectation of being able to accomplish 12 months worth of work in nine months. Um, and so rather than just add stuff back in, once we got those, um, once we got those figures from the state, we, we chose to, um, I guess, leave some on the table, so to speak, to give ourselves greater flexibility for uh, any changes that may come up between now and town meeting or, um, you know, offset, offset the impacts in a, a relatively small way, um, to the taxpayer, but that's the, that wasn't that wasn't the goal at the beginning, but um, it's just how it evolved. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. Okay, so the the first proposal is that we would um, essentially ask town meeting to reappropriate the balance of what is was left at the end of fiscal twenty. Um, so we, we expect at this time that we have about $712,000 remaining from fiscal 20 appropriation that can be carried forward to help offset the fiscal 21 budget. Um, this $712,000, and it does take into account that in total, our revenue was about $400,000. The actual was about $400,000 less than the budgeted or estimated. This is something that does not happen very often, but as you can see, when we talked about uh, the, the local excise taxes, we, had, we came in the significant underperformance there. And so we do want to account for that because if we were to, to just sort of disregard that, then we, we would be eating into free cash in a way that we hadn't planned on doing. So, so we do have $712,000 to carry forward. Um, you might wonder, you know, why do we have this? Uh, I can tell you every year we have something because every, every year really in, the, in a very long, very long history, um, We've we've always our revenues have always come in over our estimates, even if slightly, and our expenditures have always come in under. This year, it's a little more pronounced uh, because several of our operations were closed, either partially or fully, for a period of months. Um, so we had buildings closed, we had lower utilities, a lower, in many instances, need to purchase supplies and services such as custodial services. Uh, we also had some salary savings from part-time staff that, that were not working or paid during the pandemic. Um, you may wonder why, why won't this close to free cash? In any other year, it would close to free cash, but the legislature in recognition of the significant budgetary issues that communities are facing provided a special one-time authorization to allow us to recapture uh, the savings from fiscal 20. Um, the downside of, of recapturing and, and reusing this again is, uh, you know, we, we won't have 
much going toward free cash. And the process to recapture is to present this to town meeting. It's actually, we're actually recapturing a, um, a specific amount of free cash. So when it comes to town meeting, and, and we can talk about this further, but when it comes to town meeting, it will be an appropriation from free cash for the purpose of recovering the unspent fiscal 20 appropriation. Are there any questions about um, this? Mike, you're... Mike, I think you're muted. Yeah. Kirk, sorry. Uh, will this happen at this town meeting in September? Yes, it will. And under what article will we address this matter? So this, this will be part of the budget motion. The budget motion includes all of the sources of funding to support the appropriation. So one of the sources will be free cash for this purpose. Got it. Thank you. Okay, next slide. So the second proposal would be to reduce the fiscal 21 salary reserve. Originally, we had included $500,000 for salary reserve as an amount to provide employees with um, an annual salary increase and to settle collective bargaining agreements. Um, this, this reserve of 500,000 was lower than what you have typically seen in, um, in prior budgets. And the reason it was lower was because we did have some savings from fiscal 19 and 20. You may recall that we had um, at least one contract that felt like it was in negotiations forever. It, um, it had been expired for multiple years. So we were carrying amounts in, in multiple years uh, salary reserve that all of the contracts have been funded and we do have a small amount remaining. And so we were going to use that plus a new appropriation of half a million dollars to provide an inflationary increase uh, based on what's happening and what we're hearing from other communities in terms of how they're settling contracts and, um, and providing increases to non-union staff, we've cut that in half. So that's a savings of $250,000. Stephen, did you want to add anything additionally? Yeah, I think it's, um, there's a lot happening with our compensation plan in that um, like I said, the Pay Equity Act has been kind of a game changer in terms of analyzing positions. And so in, in um, those um, days before COVID-19 that I can barely recall, we were prepping to do a compensation um, and classification study. And obviously that um, got set aside to deal with the pandemic. But, um, you know, I think we're, that's kind of a, a part of, of how we're looking at uh, compensation. And that's why we're able to make some of the, the strategic decisions on the, on the plan or on the uh, salary reserve uh, to help bridge the gap. Terry. So um, are you saying that there will still be enough to fund the union contracts and a cost of living or, or some type of increase for the non-union employees? Uh, yeah, we, we have four contracts that have expired. Um, and so we have, and we haven't really bargained. Um, we've had many discussions, but when it comes time to talking about compensation, we don't really have much to offer. We hadn't gotten to this point until Saturday. Um, so it's been kind of, uh, evolving. And now, now that we've kind of landed on the spot, we will, you know, reach out to the collective bargaining units and, and that we have that for which we do not have settled contracts, uh, and just let them know that this is, um, where we are, uh, for FY21. So, so just to be clear, um, um, are the non-union employees 
going to be able to possibly get an increase in FY21 or the, only, only? No, no, we're we're projecting that this should be sufficient for an inflationary increase for all employees, for all regular status employees. Thank you. Next slide, please, Kate. So the third proposal uh, would be a reduction in the fiscal 21 capital outlay portion of our capital improvement plan. This is the cash portion of our plan. And um, the original ask was $1,787,000. Um, we, because of our uh, attention to pandemic response, we're not able to fully expend our fiscal 20 capital outlay program. It, it is underexpended um, to the tune of $475,000. This is typically, uh, we just didn't have the bandwidth to, to um, complete programs and purchases. And so we would be, we have encumbered that amount and we would be looking to reduce the fiscal 21 outlay by that amount because we don't need, it doesn't need to be uh, reappropriated or have an, an additional appropriation. And then we also are looking to reduce the original request by about $230,000. And um, in the the additional adjustments column, you can see we're proposing a reduction of about 125,000 in technology, which would result in a, a zero dollar increase in technology in fiscal 21. Now that doesn't mean that we're not going to move forward with our technology plan, uh, but as you can see, we do have some carry forward from 20. We also have some additional amounts encumbered from prior years. And we do still have that uh, large authorization from three years ago, the $1.5 million for the three major programs. So we do have plenty of work to do in advancing technology without needing a new appropriation for fiscal 21. We are- yeah. oh. So yeah, and I think, um just to, and I mentioned this at the outset, this is really, it's a reflection in part of, again, needing to reduce expenditures uh, for the FY21 budget. But again, it's also, um, it's not a reflection that the things that were on this list aren't really needed and we don't need to invest in, uh, to make capital investments in our infrastructure, whether it's roads or um, technology or um, trees or any of the things you see in this list. It's just uh, an acceptance of the fact that we're only going to have three quarters of a year at best to do it. And if we fully funded this, we would hit the end of FY21 with another significant unspent um, balance, we believe, of capital projects. And so we just didn't think it was right to levy that if we didn't think we could reasonably get through all that work. All right. Um, so... Um of the original $195,000 that was recommended for the technology fund, how much do you plan to actually expend during the year? To expend in fiscal 21? Yes. Um, I would say depending, well. It's, we, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah, you know, I, I would say significant significant amounts, um, you know, prob probably $100,000 or so. But again, we have that encumbered. Yeah. And what is the balance currently in the technology fund? You know, off the top? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have that um, readily available, but I, I would say it's pretty close to the 195000 Okay, thank you. Jerry, or excuse me, Jane. Yeah, this, that number also caught my eye, especially because in this current time, um, I'm guessing that more residents, more more of Concord is reliant on technology um, than perhaps in our history. Um, 
So um, I don't know the the detailed allocation, but um, it's a, it's a striking place to reduce. <laughs> I appreciate the the overall effort. Well, I think it's it's for it's for technology to support town operations. No, yeah, I would say this is probably not public facing. Yeah. No, but I'm I'm thinking about the uh, the technology that allows a lot of the public facing. We own anyway. Well, I, obviously, a lot of, like you as you noted, Jane, a lot of that has changed. COVID nineteen really radically altered our um, technology profile and our, you know, systems that we thought were um, important to us now don't seem as important. And, and, um, so, and so we've had to invest in technology throughout the pandemic. Fortunately, there is the, the CARES Act funding um, can offset those, those costs because they are really pandemic related um, technology upgrades or changes, but again, this is this is one of those things where by the end of FY21, do we think we'll have all of that figured out, spec'd and expended? Probably not. Uh, and so it's and the other thing is we are in the process of um, hiring a new CIO who may come in with a different view as well. And so it was really parking that money for a time that we don't really know. When we're going to get to it and what it's going to look like just like i said i think in the moment we're in we just felt like it was you know it just seemed reasonable to, to, to carry that forward okay. thank you um so so the next proposed reduction is in sustainability the original request one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars, proposing a reduction of fifty five thousand to to bring the new request to $105,000. And again, this is an area that that we understand is is very important, but we do have some encumbrances in addition to the um, the carry forward amount. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have we don't have a fiscal 20 carry forward. We do have some prior year encumbrances, so we do feel that we have sufficient funding to maintain the work plan for that activity in fiscal 21 uh, between the new allocation of 105,000 plus the existing encumbrances. The other, oh, Jane, did you? Well, I just, I would wanna know from a calculation of um, the town's ability to meet our own professed goals for the town's footprint in sustainability uh, emissions specifically that that doesn't you know that that isn't delaying our ability to achieve that uh, I, I we didn't really run that calculation um we understand like i said carrie you know, we know that that's something that's that's it's important operationally because it does generally yield savings over time but um there isn't an area of government that, that uh, well, let me say this, police and fire and the public health and the health department are the only ones that don't have to give something up in all of this. I mean, departments have to give things up to help meet the gap. And, you know, we thought a 33% 30 reduction in sustainability when there's other funds that could offset that um, and the limited time we have to do some of that, some of that work uh, made it a reasonable, um, a reasonable sacrifice. Um, a a five thousand dollar reduction in the library computer equipment. Did we lose our presentation? Sorry, sorry. that's okay. Um, so I was looking up. <clears throat> I was looking up what that fifty thousand was for because I thought it might put Jane's mind at ease. So um, the answer is uh, historic preservation. So it was. 50,000 to conduct research to develop a best practices manual and template for community members to consult um, with how to retrofit historic uh, homes and structures for a more sustainable um, infrastructure. And 
that was actually going to be done in concert with the University of New Hampshire in the intern program. And we have since had to, we, we still have the intern, but uh, she's working remotely with Kate, Kate Hanley. Right. And so we're not able to do this because she couldn't get into the historic structures and, and assess it. So um, I don't believe that the $50,000 will be uh, detrimental to any of the town or community programs. We would be, that was a, a bonus, an extra that we were going to have. And so we'll, we'll re-propose that in FY22. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I'm sorry I screwed up the... <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you know, we got to get back. What, what slide number? Question, Susan? Yeah, Jeff. I just got a general question, and that was how, for how long can you encumber funds? Because you said there, there were funds in certain categories that had been encumbered for past years. How, mm -hmm. how many years? I mean, how long can you do that? Is so it that, the specific that. project is done or? Right, that, that's a, a great question, Susan. So uh, you may recall in the, um, for the for the upcoming town meeting, we've actually included both the capital outlay, the cash portion of the CIP and the debt portion in one article. Um, it, in, the, in fiscal 20 and years before that, the capital outlay portion was included in the operating budget. So technically, at the end of the fiscal year, even though it was for capital, it should close. Now, the town has a history of encumbering those funds so that they are available until the purchase is made or the, the project is completed. Um, and, and so we've, we've actually moved this so that we are aligning our practice really with what the requirement of, of the law is. So these these capital encumbrances can stay active as long as the project is active. Great, right. thank you. The next reduction is um, 5,000 in computer library equipment. And currently the library has about 50,000 encumbered for computer equipment. And so this is a, a reduction uh, of of the, their uh, original request. And then the final reduction is 50,000 for vehicles and heavy equipment in CPW. And um, this one this one is is another hard one because it means that um, that we're we're going to delay the replacement of a piece of equipment for uh, an additional year, but it, it is um, an adjustment that was made in consultation with the CPW director, and he does believe that we would be able to push this out a year. So the original capital outlay request, again, a million seven hundred eighty-seven thousand. The revised request is a million eighty-one thousand. Next slide. Uh oh. Slide 11. Got it. Thank you. Okay, um, did you. Wait, did you want to talk about some of the changes in the capital and the debt capital? Oh, okay, here we are. Uh, I think we're on that. Right. Okay. So, so this, this really probably should have been titled Step 3B. Um, these are, these are changes in the, in the debt reduction, in the, the capital debt portion of the capital plan um, over the five-year period. None of these changes will result in a budget adjustment in fiscal 21 because these are the, the newest authorizations in fiscal 21 don't have a budget impact until they're permanently financed, which would be fiscal 22 at the earliest. So I have identified and summarized the changes that are being proposed um, what that estimated debt service savings is. And again, it's at least a year out from, from the particular capital year. But Stephen or Kate, if you would like to review these, I'm happy to stop talking for a moment. 
Stephen, do you want to do that or do you want me to? No, go ahead, Kay. And you've, you've been um, working on most of these. So um, we reduced the amount for the Giro property, um, which essentially was going to a larger kind of pavilion um, area and uh, the revised amount on, on that. Um, uh, we also uh, have pushed out um, the ride out bathroom facility. We pushed that out uh, another year. So we were slated to spend about $195,000 uh, doing that in this fiscal year. And we're gonna be pushing that out until fiscal year 22. Um, the ladder number one refurbishment for the um, fire department has been um, pushed out until 22. Um, and we were able to keep, we kept the $200,000 obligation that we had for um, safety surfacing uh, because the state has said that we can take until October to get that in. It was initially going to be July, um, but it, they haven't taken away that responsibility completely. Um, and so as far as a uh, white pond, um, we split that up a bit differently. Um, and so what we've done is we've essentially taken um, what would have been the $600,000 that we were going to ask for uh, in this fiscal year. And um, we've kept that, but in fiscal year, uh, we got rid of the 600 out of Giro um, and pushed, like I said, pushed right out off. And so we have White Pond in fiscal year 22 redo, uh, increased to five instead of two. So that we won't see uh, really any work um, until about April of 2020 that will start. So we've sort of delayed that project almost an entire year. Well, actually an entire year. Um, and so we'll, we'll likely come back for town meeting next year and ask for the um, additional 500,000 to do that stormwater management. And uh, we then zeroed out um, fiscal year 24 um, and 25's uh, slated requests or, or uh, bookmarks there for White Pond um, and really you're just focusing on um, the stormwater and, and ADA accessibility. So we won't be um, probably doing anything more for that for a while. Uh, we kept the uh, Warner's Pond dredging feasibility, um, but uh, slightly reduced that so that it did spread over three years. Um, and so I think you can see here that essentially, you know, we went from 5.25 million um, for this fiscal year's request and the revised amount is um, 3.725. So the difference is about a million and a half. Um, and some of that is pushed out so that you can see that next fiscal year um, would have an increase from what we were projecting. But again, that, that number is really more of a bookmark right now until we see how far we get uh, in the projects that are already funded and, and moving forward. So I, I would just note on on the latter one refurbishment that was pushed out um, to to fiscal was was in twenty one pushed out to twenty two. That project is actually was not scheduled to go forward until fiscal twenty two anyway. We did bring it forward because we have a target amount of. Uh, debt that we plan for each year and we we did we were originally under so we moved it forward but now we're just moving it back to to its original year so there we don't expect any issues with um with the latter one running in service through fiscal 21 before the refurbishment thank you and again, um, no budgetary impacts to this in fiscal 21, but certainly budgetary, positive budgetary impacts in 22. And this really will help us because we do expect that we're gonna have a, a tough, at least a tough couple of budget years. And I, I think fiscal 22 is probably going to make fiscal 21 look easy. So I do think this, this certainly helps set the stage for uh, debt spending in fiscal 22.
Okay. Do, I, do I infer that uh, that currently revised 6.195 in fiscal 22 might be revised yet again as we get a little bit closer to that time frame? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Thank you. Linda? So, yeah, Carrie. Um, so it sounds like you're anticipating that the um, certain amount that you plan for debt annually is going to be less for this year. You're planning on that. Um, not, not less in 21, but less in 22. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, can you say a little bit more about that? So um, when we talked about what was available to carry forward into 20, um, or not, 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 actually not there, when we talked about um, the revisions to the fixed costs, we were able to make an adjustment to debt service I was able to pull out my estimate and put in the actual. So that right. I've taken into account the savings in fiscal 21 for debt service. What we're talking about here are changes to the fiscal 21 debt plan, which would be permanently financed at the end of 21 with the first budgetary impact in 22. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, next slide, please, Kate. So we we do have um, a number of vacant positions. And what we did was back on May 15th, we took a snapshot of, of vacant positions. And the town manager and human resources director did an analysis and identified each vacant position as green, yellow, or red, green being okay to fill, yellow, um, additional analysis, and red positions on hold. And as a part of rebalancing the fiscal 21 budget, the town manager stated, okay, that those positions that we back in May identified as on hold, they're gonna continue to be on hold and not budgeted in fiscal 21 and that nets a savings of $125,000. The uh, green, yellow, and red aren't the most original, um, you know, mark markers for types of things like that, but we, it, it was really, each, each position was reviewed with the department head for um, operational significance. Uh, and so some of them um, may have been planned positions. Um, I'll give you an example, we have um, you know, it, it, and some, it's, you know, some yellow positions may be ones that conditions may evolve and, and they may grow. They may become more important operationally or less. Uh, and then, like I said, some of the ones that are red have been either been vacant for a while. And if we've lived with them, if we've lived without that position being filled for six months, can we live for another nine? Uh, the, so that was kind of the thought process. The positions are all, um, are all, Ultimately, when we get back to full strength, we will we'll need people in those positions to continue to provide high levels of service. But in this time, we needed to to just you know put the put the pause button on for those. Thank you. Um, so the the next proposal are are just some miscellaneous reductions. Street lighting, we're we're able to reduce that budget by seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. Um, due to the installation of energy efficient fixtures. And then custodial services. And I think I, I would ask if, if Kate wants to add anything to this because this is her um, endeavor, but we're moving toward a new model uh, of providing custodial services. We're not at this time projecting any budgetary savings in fiscal 21, or we've yet to quantify budgetary savings, uh, but, but we do have a, a, a very innovative plan that's currently in design. And Kate, would you like to say anything about that? Sure, yep. Yeah. So with the, um, with the growth of the facilities um, department, uh, we have uh, really 
kind of taken a hard look at all of the contracts and that really kind of coincided with um, how we were going to prepare for reopening even um, partially for staff as far as cleaning with the new COVID guidelines. And so Ryan or our facilities director and I kind of sat together and went through um, and just sort of realized um, that pretty much every department has a different vendor that they use for various products. And um, it would be certainly a lot simpler, um, particularly during COVID times when not everybody was in at the same time. If everybody utilized the same paper goods, the same cleaning products, and that they were interchangeable. Um, in that time, we also uh, instituted daily cleanings at least twice a day. And so it, it kind of begged the question, um, while we're not inviting some of the contracted cleaners to, to come in because of contract tracing issues. And so uh, we made a pitch kind of early on um, that, you know, asking, let's, let's centralize this. So instead of having, you know, eight or nine different budget accounts that are tied to one particular building, we just have all of those rolled in so that we say, you know, cleaning products. And so we had seven buildings that budgeted, say, $100 for cleaning project for, uh, products. We put, you know, that $700 in the facilities budget. And we thought by doing that and, and really centralizing both the ordering and the, and the uh, processes, that we would probably be able to save, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. And so essentially all of those uh, line items from the buildings were rolled into facilities and then uh, 10 percent reduction was taken off off of the top. Um, and, you know, we're very hopeful that it would be more than that, but at least um, we feel like the level of efficiency could at least at least have that amount. So uh, this year we'll be tracking in and, and kind of better quantifying that for um, our request uh, in fiscal year 22. And, and so I would just say that the 10% savings that Kate referenced was already factored into our original fiscal 21 budget proposal. So that, that's why you're not seeing it here. It, it's already accounted for. Good initiative. Okay, next slide. Um, Actually, before I go there, the, the final proposal was the savings in the um, CPS budget, which I at this point, it's it's fairly minor. But again, the superintendent is still working with her staff and the school committee to uh, to relook at their budget requests and potentially there may be some additional savings. So we're we're in the home stretch here. Um, this shows the estimated property tax increase. Uh, back in December, at the time of final guideline, the estimated property tax increase to the existing homeowner was 2.8%. That did assume new growth of 1.1 million. It did not include the permanent financing of the middle school feasibility study. And it also included an estimate for the Minuteman VOTEC assessment. So now factoring in the revised revenue projections, uh, reducing new growth by $200,000 and um, including the middle school feasibility study, the final assessment for Minuteman VOTEC and some other minor adjustments, we're at an estimated property tax increase of 3.37%. And as we mentioned, when we went through the process of, of relooking at the budget, we came up with um, savings uh, savings over lost revenue of about three hundred thousand, a surplus of about three hundred thousand dollars. If we were to um, apply that, reduce the the budget by that amount, we would be reducing the estimated property tax increase to. 3.08%. So we're pretty, given everything that's happened, we're still pretty darn close to where we thought we would be at the end of December. We're, we've just taken a much different route to get there. So Carrie, um, you, uh, on the last point you've made, um, if the schools are able to find some more money, the um, tax levy might decrease further? Yes. Okay. 
Well, uh, and and uh, I'm correct that you folks will be making a presentation similar to this to the Finance Committee? Yes. Thursday or Tuesday that you're doing that? On Thursday. Okay. And we have one final slide on the CARES Act. Stephen, do you want to, to go through that? Yeah, the CARES Act funding has certain amounts for every municipality, and ours is 1.6 for FY20 and uh, FY, I think, next, through next December. Um, and so part of FY21. Um, it does not, it's, it specifically does not allow you to replace lost revenue, which if it did, we could just take the loss in excise taxes and local receipts and plug and potentially plug it with CARES Act money. Um, but things like increased costs, um, potential increased costs for custodial services, even though I think we're going to save money, um, those costs in the short term can be reimbursed through CARES Act. Uh, like I mentioned, we talked about technology. There's been several technology upgrades that we've made to help uh, facilitate telework that are also uh, eligible for CARES Act. Um, increased overtime as a result of uh, keeping shifts I, um, uh, not co intermingling shifts in police and fire. Uh, those increased overtime costs are eligible. So um, we have been spending uh, a significant amount of money handling um, managing COVID-19, but uh, I don't think we've made a large dent in the CARES Act yet. I think we're, um, and so we're being, we're being judicious with how we're, we're spending that money, but it, the good news is we have some, some of those increased costs will be, um, will be reimbursed. That's great. So I don't know if it's Stephen or Carrie wants to answer this. Would you say that the majority of costs that we've incurred have been personnel costs? Pers uh, personnel and supplies. Yeah, it's really about 50-50 at this point. The We're really limited in um, personnel costs. So if we had to bring on additional unbudgeted staff, we could... Uh, use CARES Act funding for that. Otherwise, we're limited to overtime that's specifically related to pandemic response, such as in public safety. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the select board for the town manager or the chief financial officer? Uh, yes. Um, I, I think this is a really excellent presentation. I want to thank both of you. It was very thorough very detailed, um, and I love the conservative approach um, and, and considering FY22, because I agree, FY22 could be a big problem, and even FY23. I only have one quick question. This is about the um, Fiscal Policy Committee at the MMA. Um, you, you both, one of you or both of you wrote in feedback about the um, state-owned land, the correctional facilities, um, which I submitted. But I, I see here on these slides, um, I think it's your second slide, you've got a zero placeholder for that for both FY20 and 21. Does that mean that we never got any um, cherry sheet aid of any type for the um, correctional facility, even in FY20? So um, the, we don't ever budget for the, inst the correctional facility institutional aid because it does not come to us as part of the cherry sheet. It comes in a separate appropriation. And so we, the town has never, or traditionally has not included any estimate for that, even though for the last several years, we have received something. I think we receive around 150,000 is my recollection. So that is something when it comes into us, it helps us, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we typically have some free cash. We're generating free cash because we're not including an estimate for that. Okay, so it's showing on your slide here. Um, I think it's slide number two. Yeah. But, but but it doesn't really come in in this form? It doesn't. I mean, it is it is state aid. When it comes in, we, we code it to state aid, but we have not um, traditionally provided a, a budgetary estimate for it. 
Okay. Are there other questions? Well, thank you uh, both very much. That was, uh, I'm sure that was quite difficult to come to grips with, and I appreciate it very much. The uh, next item on our agenda is, uh, is the position on warrant articles 45, 46, and 47. So the first one is Article 45, this is the electronic recording of select board executive sessions. Is there any comments on you would like to make? And does anybody have a proposed motion? Well, I would propose a motion to take no action on this warrant article. Second. A second. Is there any further discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? You have to unmute yourself. Linda. Linda, you're on mute. Miss Ackerman. Uh, aye. Miss Bates. Aye. Miss Hotchkiss. Aye. Mr. Lawson. Aye. Myself, Miss Escobedo. Aye. Thank you. I know it passes unanimously. The next article is Article 46. This is public posting of open media law complaints. Again, is there anyone with a motion? I would move that we take no action on Article 46. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? Would the clerk please call on uh, Just, Just one comment. Um, I think that what we've been doing is posting these after the um, ruling comes in. Correct. We, all right. So I, I think that's the proper way to do it. So. Would the clerk please call the roll. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you. I know it passes unanimously. The next article is Article 47, Investigation and Amendment to the Town Council Bylaw. Again, I would move no action on this article. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? We've already dealt with this. And... All right, would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you. I know the passage unanimously. Now, there are a number of additional articles for which we have to take a position, but all of the remaining articles are subject to um, the, re the new public hearings that we're going to have August 17th, 18th, and 19th. And I must confess to have forgotten, so I apologize to all of you. Did we conclude that we wanted to schedule select board meetings directly after the public hearing or wait and uh, do it at a separate meeting? And I'm sorry, I just don't remember where we came down on that, Susan. I think we decided for the first two hearings, we were going to do the meeting after the hearings, but for the third hearing, we were gonna do it the next morning. Is that? what other people yeah. understood. Yeah, right. All right. So on August 17th, we'll schedule a meeting following the public hearing. On August 18th, we'll schedule a meeting the public, following the public hearing. And then the planning board's public hearing is on Wednesday. So we'll schedule, I want to do it early than on the 19th because we want to be able to get the finance committee. Uh, I, I think you suggested nine o'clock previously. Thank you. I just right. nine. Nine o'clock on the 20th. Got it. All right. I will send out a confirming memorandum together with the Zoom meeting information on that. Thank you for you guys remembering. All right. Next is a discussion of liquor license rebates. So um, the proposal is that um, we would rebate liquor license fees for the period where all of the restaurants who could serve liquor were either closed or prohibited from serving liquor. And Stephen, I don't know whether you have a comment on this or not. I know you're have, have looked at this in other jurisdictions. Yeah, I, um, I, other jurisdictions have, I, I've seen, have done it. 
Um, I think I act and did a 25% um, rebate. I think um, on its face, it does make sense because they, the liquor licenses were not able to be used. Um, beer and wine have been able to be used because of takeout. Um, so if someone had only beer and wine, I don't think that they have had the opportunity anyway to continue to sell. Um, but um, full service liquor lights uh, and then liquor stores, of course, have been open. They were deemed essential uh, sure. from the beginning. But full, full uh, res restaurants with full bars um, have not been able to be open and serve alcohol until just recently when you signed the um, cocktails to go. So I do think it's not unreasonable for the board to entertain this, but and I think I would ask Carrie to weigh in, but the, the um, funds to do that would have to come from somewhere out of the the information we just presented. Could it come from the CARES Act? No, I don't. I don't think so. I'd have to look. I, the CARES Act is for the is, is to the government. It's not to businesses specifically. Um, there there may be another round of stimulus that may be coming, but um, we could find and we would just have to move some things around. I don't care if you want to weigh in on that. And I don't, I'm not really sure how much it is either. Okay. That was well. That was my question, which is, how much is this, and um, is this a four-month rebate? You know, I, I don't remember specifically when the act. You know, when the governor signed the act saying you could have cocktails to go. Um, so it's. I think, I think a twenty-five percent rebate would be would make sense for for those. For those in, the, like I said, for those who have restaurants with full bars that haven't been able to really serve until, I mean, really, it's been until outdoor dining really mm -hmm. reopened was when everyone has had, and not everybody has done it, but everybody has had the opportunity to reopen and serve alcohol um, through outdoor dining well, I like at limited it. capacity, but it's still I the like opportunity the idea to. Of a simple percentage rebate rather than trying to fine tune this from. Um, how does the rest of you feel about this? Susan? I think a 25% um, reduction sounds reasonable to me, given the circumstances. Linda? Yeah, I, I, I wish I had a better handle on what, the, what that would translate into as a total dollar amount. Um, but in, in, in theory, um, I, I, I think people are looking for some relief and um, and we don't know what the next stimulus package is going to look like. So there's a timing, a little bit of a timing issue here, too. Is this a proposal for just the all alcoholic restaurants, or are we talking about all establishments, even if they were able to sell takeout? Um, uh, I'm not clear on exactly what what this covers. This covers, I, I would suggest this covers restaurants that have a liquor license. And the Massachusetts liquor license is $2,000 annual liquor license. So essentially this would be a $500. If we took the 25%, it would be a $500 rebate. It's not a huge amount of money, but uh, okay. you know, some of these places are really hurting. And yep. Okay. You know, Jeremy is on on here. He's our license administ administrator. I don't know if he has a sense of how many licenses fit the bill. Sorry to throw, put you on the spot, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, it's fine. I actually, I don't have a number in front of me, but after this meeting, um, I would be able to add it up and give you a dollar. Great. Right. And uh, Jane, did I did we get your input on this? No, I just I, I was curious. I mean, much like Linda, um, I I don't have a problem with with uh, a rebate. I mean, I uh, we want to support um, all the businesses that have been hurt, and I can it, it's understandable. I just would love to know what that number is, so it's not a. Well, why don't we do this then? Uh, if, uh, if it's all right with you, I will work with Stephen or Carrie and Jeremy to get the facts about how many restaurants, how much this would total and all of that, and check with council too about the appropriate language for a motion. And I'll bring this back to the select board then on the 10th. 
with uh, the facts and proposed language for emotion. Does that seem reasonable to everybody? It does, yeah. I, I just I just want to clarify. I, I don't I don't know. And Carrie, you can you just correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if we can issue a rebate back into um, FY20 because it is closed out. Um, but it could be a reduction in the fee for FY21. Uh, I just want we just need to make sure we're clear on what we're researching to do. Is that right, Carrie, that we, we would not be able to rebate what they've already paid the last year? Right, right, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, that could just be part of our homework assignment to get the appropriate language part of it. All right, uh, thank you all very much. The next item on our agenda is the annual uh, election officer appointments. Um, we have a memorandum from the town clerk and if there is no uh, discussion on this matter, I would entertain a motion. Move to appoint the election officers as listed in the memo from the town clerk, uh, Kari Tare, dated July 31, 2020. Is there a second? Okay. Could the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hodgkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo, aye. Thank you, and I know that it passes unanimously. We have no committee nominations. Uh, so next will be committee liaison reports. Um, I will start. I had only one official town meeting this week, which is a joint school committee meeting. Um, it was a very interesting meeting. Um, they discussed three uh, 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 important issues. One is, you might recall, a year or so ago, they had an early retirement and uh, allowed them to save considerable sum of money. We were planning to bring that back for the next fiscal year, but the superintendent is bringing it back now. I, I she's working on that, and I suspect it. Um, a discussion about their calendar, and then a significant presentation discussion about school reopening plans. And as I mentioned to you before, uh, I've invited the superintendent Peter with us next month to uh, discuss those reopening plans. And I thought who would like to be next. Well, okay. okay, I'll volunteer. Um, I uh, have two, two committees to report on. The first one is the White Pond Association. And um, uh, I think that as was noted in the beginning of the meeting, um, there's a lot of concern being expressed by White Pond uh, Association is going to be handled, I hope, go in a going forward manner, including the the opportunity to get Ranger on um, the back half on Sachem's Cove. Um, the committee uh, voted to uh, forward their their report and their recommendations, which I believe we have received now, and um, uh, it, it goes to the you know, the, their suggestions for continued maintenance and, and, and care of the pond. Um, it ha, you know, I'm way, I would like to, to uh, invite Carmen to present that at a future select board meeting. Um, I'm trying to reach out to her to see if she is available on the 24th, is she? Have I reached out to her? I have. Um, uh, but there are a number of, of meetings I think that we are looking to have with um, with Carmen as as the chair um, that I think we're trying to coordinate schedules. Um, and uh, that gets me to the second piece, which is uh, an invitation to uh, the White Pond Association to join a uh, a meeting that uh, our town manager is overseeing. Uh, when he returns from his his uh, his pseudo vacation um, of of town staff to discuss a lot of the issues that we've already we've already acknowledged tonight. Um, second committee I I uh, I'm reporting on is the ag committee. Um, the the most most prescient um, issue that they're looking at is 
Ag Day. Um, at this point, there's still a, a split on the of the um, of the committee on whether or not on on what a uh, a 2020 Ag Day would look like in order to be able to be uh, rel you know to comply with um, current standards and um, and therefore whether they would support it that that com conversation will happen later in the week so stay tuned well, I would encourage them to get that matter resolved we I think uh, I agree all right thank you uh, Linda um, I attended the Juro um, pl Park plan update um, forum and um, and thank Kate uh, just for uh, doing that. Um, I was disappointed personally that there weren't more members of the public to attend at least in person given the number of concerns and questions and other things that we had heard about. Uh, but she took a high level um, view of changes in the plan itself um, and also um, gave a little bit of a preview on some of the changes that would be part of the budget presentation we've just listened to. So thank her for doing that. Thank you. Susan? Uh, yes, I had. To, I was at the Giro Forum too and I'd echo what Linda said. I'm sorry if there's a lot of background and big truck just pulled up across the street and I have the I'm on a screen in porch. At any rate, I had two meetings. The Board of Registrars met on the 30th and they talked about evolving um, guidance coming down about the elections. Um, and they're going to meet again on August 6th to continue the discussion. But um, Kari did mention that um, she had already received more requests for mail-in ballots than the number of people who turned out for the last state election in a in a presidential election year. So I guess that would be 2016. And really the concern is more about November. So they're looking at polling places and looking at electronic check-in devices and ways to reduce the necessary staffing, although they have the, the list we just approved, there are um, some new workers, poll workers on there, which will, the result is that she feels confident there'll be enough people for whatever the needs are, but they may reconfigure, they have to reconfigure polling places or they may have to do that. So a lot going on there and I'll have more to report next week. Um, the other meeting was the personnel board and the main thing that is of interest to us, and they did advise, they voted to advise the select board that the Article 6 should be considered non-essential and uh, not necessary in the, in the September town meeting to be on that warrant. And that's it for me. Thank you. So I will let, um, I will let the town moderator know that if she doesn't know already, so she'll be updated on that. Terry. Okay, I'll be very quick. I too was at the Juro um, forum and had the same reaction. I was really hoping we'd get a good uh, group of people listening and asking questions. So I was disappointed, but um, Kate did a good presentation on that. And then I attended the library committee meeting where they had a very thoughtful discussion and you heard all about that tonight already. And I was at the movie, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, there's a few kinks that we need to get out of the um, system, but it was a great pilot project and great to see the community come out um, and come out, you know, have an evening out for a change. Sure. That's it. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is public comments. If there are public comments to be made, uh, please unmute yourself and hopefully I will see that happen. I don't see any now. Tanya, unmute yourself, please. Yes, thank you, Mike. Um, Tanya oh, Galus, yes, I will say it this time, Tanya Galus, 62 Prescott Road. Uh, first, I have a question. Um, 
Yes, you know, I, I wrote to you uh, after writing that letter about citizen petition articles and how they are um, handled, etc. That was posted a couple of meetings ago. I, I uh, expressed my reservations that I hadn't meant that to be posted and, and I don't really mind it as much right now. I, I do have some concerns because it, it, it was it was mailed to some private email addresses and that's kind of showing in public that the, that was not my intention. My, it was meant as an informal note. So I, I wondered if anything can be done about removing those private addresses and also about whether it is now the select board's policy to publish every citizen letter because I am concerned that that may discourage some people from writing letters if if uh, if that's the automatic po default policy of publishing citizen letters. All right, thank you. Yeah, and no, I had another comment too. Uh, uh, my Matt Matt had raised this. In, yeah, um, my other comment was um, uh, when you decided your position on Article 45, 46, 47 today. Um, I, I was disappointed that there wasn't more discussion about it. I know you're not required to, and it's just, it's just your position. Um, and I, I, I myself have not made up my mind about those articles, so I'm not like rooting for them or either way. But, um, but, but, uh, for example, for the open meeting law posting, you know, so a private citizen who who does their own open meeting law complaint like I have done may or may not want everything to be public until a decision has been made, for example. But um, um, anyway, I just I just wish that there had been more discussions of the pros and cons. And obviously, you see a lot of cons, and it would have been good for we the public. We had, a public we, we had a public hearing on all of these articles, uh, where the public had a chance to talk about it. And Okay, thank you. Matt, your hand was up. I don't know if you... All I wanted to note was that in terms of the policy to publish uh, letters that were sent to the select board, that I, I just had made a request in that regard, just for greater transparency, to ensure that if someone sends a letter to the select board, I mean, that it is seen um, that, in fact, we have gotten um, comments elsewhere, you know, on the planning board, for example, that... It, um, members of the public were upset that their input was not seen. And so I think that this is actually an important move for transparency. If someone submits a letter to the select board, it is a public record. And I, I believe that it should be seen. All right, thank you, Matt. Are I there, wish the planning board would do the same then. <laughs> are there any additional comments? I'm not seeing any additional hands, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move. To unmute yourself if you're going to make a motion. I move to adjourn. A second. Would the clerk please call the roll. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Uh, Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you all very much. I know it passes unanimously. I appreciate everybody's input. Uh, for attending the meeting. Stay well. Good afternoon. Yes, stay.